Welcome to another Viewer Scenario video. When we reached 2000 subscribers a little while ago, I sent out a request for Viewer Scenarios to be sent in. Many people did, and we have about 18 more scenarios to cover. In this episode, we have a shorter one about what if the Confederates established the Golden Circle, and an absolute massive one about what if the Martians invaded the Earth in the 1910s. So let's dive in. This first scenario is a cover of the BBC's The Great Martian War, where Marklin added much more depth to documentarity, mainly by actually exploring the rest of the world instead of only Western Europe. He also cites The War of the World Goliath and Swarm on the Somme, an alternate history scenario from alternatehistory.com. And this scenario covers what if the War of the World Martians actually invaded Earth in the 1910s. The year is 1913. Europe was a place of seeming civility and peace, but there was an undercurrent of change and fear of war being an inevitability. The old faced the new as the Tsar struggled to maintain a grip on his own people and the rise of Germany changed the power structure of Europe fundamentally. In the East and the West, the United States and Japan were rising powers themselves and neither were very interested in the affairs of Europe. However, 1913 was also viewed as an era of prosperity with all kinds of new technologies being made by rising stars in the scientific community and new weapons along with them. The Industrial Revolution is viewed by many as having been key to mankind's survival. However, war would not be started by men, but by something completely alien. The falling star, as it was called, would first be noticed in observatories all around the world, being first spotted near Mars and heading in the direction of Earth. Few outside of them noticed the falling star that brought the invaders to our world that night. And most who did merely regarded it as another shooting star. But everyone would hear about the explosion in the Black Forest deep within the German Empire. The explosion from the impact heard around Europe shook the entire continent. Unaware of the circumstances behind it, most of Europe assumed that it was the Germans testing an unknown new superweapon. With some countries even beginning to mobilize their troops out of fear of a German offensive. Upon finding out about the explosion, the Imperial German Army was deployed to investigate, under the assumption that a munitions plant had detonated, only to be completely wiped out. Loss of contact with the expedition would quickly be followed by surrounding towns being ruthlessly and systematically razed. With much of Bavaria in flames, the rest of Europe had come to realize that they were facing a threat beyond this world. Since the fallen star had first been sighted near Mars, humanity quickly gave the invaders a name, Martians. Humanity was caught on the back foot by the sudden proof of existence of life beyond Earth, and even more by their sheer hostility. Despite the massive threat posed by the invading Martians, as they would soon be called, the Germans initially refused any external aid from other European states, with many in the high command not wanting their enemies to potentially view this as a weakness. Initially, the German troops deployed believed that they were fighting some sort of communist or socialist uprising. It seemed that even the Kaiser himself believed this, as he mentioned it in telegrams to his cousins George and Nicholas in the early stages of the war, before confirmation was received of the Martians' true nature. But when the Imperial Army arrived at the scene, they saw for certain that they were fighting something far worse. Germany would not survive the onslaught, but the Kaiser and most of the military leadership just barely escaping the devastation of Berlin, with the former taking refuge in Britain with his cousin, although a good chunk of the civilian leadership of Germany ended up meeting their end to the Martians. The utter destruction of his nation would deeply impact the Kaiser's mental state, causing him to pass away only four years after fleeing to Britain. Not helping was the Kaiser giving the order over wireless to not allow any city to fall to the Martians. With the German army initially being ordered to fight to the last man to defend the Vaterland, leading to massive casualties. For a whole month, the Kaiser arrogantly refused to admit that even a single city had been lost, and disastrously divided up his forces in an attempt to fight the Martians everywhere. Rapidly, the German army would be depleted, and to supplement these forces, Wilhelm would decree that one man from every family must pick up a gun for the Fatherland, which only saw more German death. Eventually, Wilhelm II would become catatonic and stop sending orders, effectively leaving his commanders to carry out the orders. 
which would result in the remnants of the German army finally falling back and command being taken up by General Paul von Hindenburg, who aimed for a more pragmatic approach. But not being satisfied with the mere destruction of the greatest power on the continent, the Martians continued their conquests. The rest of Europe quickly mobilized when the threat became clear, but it would not be enough. Austria-Hungary collapsed almost immediately as Germany began to burn, with Vienna falling in only days. As Austrian troops, tasked with defending the city, panicked and fled at the sight of the monstrosities they would have to face. With the ensuing chaos from nationalist groups rising up across the empire doing no favors for the rest of humanity. While defensive lines across the old empire fell quickly, the Austrian armies did attempt a last stand at Tyrol, one which would become a rallying point for soldiers of the former empire. Emperor Franz Joseph's decision to remain in Vienna rather than evacuate with his family forever turned him into a martyr for humanity, leaving the Habsburg line to Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Romania would also take the time to try and prey on the dead empire, not yet realizing the true nature of the Martians. Subsequently, the Martians expanded into Russian Poland, raising Warsaw and decimating the troops sent to attack before pushing further northeast. The final nation to fall would be France. Expecting a full onslaught across the border, the French deployed their full military might to the former border with the Germans, reinforced by expeditionary troops from Britain, as well as the remnants of the German army under Hindenburg and further Belgian forces. The plan seemed flawless to most of the European military leaders of the day. They would fend off the initial onslaught across the border and then make their own massive push against the Martians from the west, while the Martians, hopefully, focused most of their efforts on the much larger Russian forces in the east, before the two forces would eventually collide together in Germany. A new alliance of powers would be formed. The Allied powers would initially include Britain, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, Sweden, Portugal, Montenegro and Albania, as well as the provisional governments of Germany and Austria-Hungary, with the majority of nations only providing aid and not actually fighting on the front yet. But unfortunately for humanity, things went bad on both fronts. The Russian army, while massive, was ill-prepared to fight a war with humans let alone Martians, and much of their army was wiped out in the first offensive. And on the other hand, the Franco-British strategy of waiting for the Martians to come to them first went away when the Martians simply went around the lines and invaded Belgium in a sick mimicry of Germany's own battle plans. Miraculously though, the Franco-British troops were able to stop the Martians from reaching Paris, and on the other side, St. Petersburg would barely be saved as well with the Martians stopping their advance on both fronts. On the Western Front, trenches would be dug, and the line was to be held against the invaders in an effort to starve them out in a defensive war. On the other side, the Russians continued trying to make pushes against the Martians, leading to a back and forth war. The Martians would also open up a front against Italy, raising Venice and making the city a rallying point throughout the war and afterwards in Italy. While another front line would form outside of Milan, the Martians would strangely withdraw a large amount of their hardware from that Italian front, instead opting to focus on France and Russia, causing another stalemate to ensue. The Martians would also take the time to quickly invade the Netherlands in early 1940. From here, the lines mostly solidified, with Central Europe becoming a no man's land. For reasons unknown at the time, the Martians did not make any major attempts to expand the front line like they did back after their first landing, instead choosing to consolidate their holdings. Now across the Atlantic, the United States and Canada were facing a refugee crisis, just as Britain was. As Europeans fled to Britain, Britain was sending their children over to Canada, out of fear of a potential Martian invasion of the island. The United States became strongly divided over what to do. Many, including former President Theodore Roosevelt, believed that if the Martians were not stopped, they would eventually try to cross over and attack North America, while the isolationist crowd believed that going to war with the Martians would be an impossible waste of American lives, and they also pointed out that the Martians seemingly had no real way of crossing over the Atlantic, being only contained to the old world. Others believed that the European militaries could simply handle the task on their own, without the need for spilling more American blood. American President Wilson himself 
viewed intervention as justified, but still had to contend with his campaign promises and the isolationist attitudes that would persist for as long as no Martian stepped foot in the US. In the end, the existential threat posed by the Martians caused a new geopolitical theory to be invented, the so-called domino theory. If America was to allow the Martians to take over France and Russia, the Martians would continue to domino across the old world and it would only be a matter of time before they managed to cross over to America as well. Combined with this, there was an extensive propaganda campaign thanks largely to horror stories from European refugees. Some of these stories were fabricated to make the Martians seem even worse than they actually were. And this effectively killed isolationism. But for the more cynical historians looking back, the main reason actually appears to be that having Europe as an alien controlled crater doesn't do wonders for the economy. And so an American expeditionary force known as the Frontiersmen was sent out, personally led by the leader of the war movement, Teddy Roosevelt, along with significant shipments of arms to Europe. While highly inexperienced, the charisma and experience of Roosevelt combined with the vast shipments of material and the morale boost from fresh troops helped keep the war going. In the Far East, Japan was relatively isolated from the conflict and had little interest in lining up for a potential massacre, but knew that they were in a good position to make demands if the Europeans ever needed help, so they chose to bide their time, while claiming that they would honor their friendship with Britain. On the mainland, the Chinese Republic under Yuan Shikai was shocked by the prospect of these star devils, largely looked the other way while they determined that no more martial landings had occurred beyond Europe. Many in China had no real interest in helping the Europeans, after the Europeans had practically carved up China among themselves, with some of the more superstitious types even believing that the Martians were demons, sent to punish Europe for its crimes against the rest of the world and China in particular. The Martians themselves were not very imposing, being a mere head with tentacles that was largely harmless, but with well-developed brains. In fact, they couldn't even move around without the assistance of their machines. Some observations included that Martians traveled outside of their machines by using floating platforms that hovered just above the ground. But the true horror of the Martians came from the variety of machines they utilized during this war. The largest of their machines were the Herons, towering three-legged fighting machines, which were piloted by the Martians themselves. These terrible devices were equipped with laser cannons that were used for demolishing buildings or flushing out any hidden troops. In the defensive sector, the Herons were protected by an antimatter shield, which made attack from above almost impossible, but left them vulnerable from below. These machines were mostly seen during the daytime or during urban battles of the war, but would go dormant at night. In truth, these machines were actually quite rare to actually fight on the battlefield, as they often chose to loom in the background and observe, leaving the fighting to the much smaller spiders. At about the size of a modern day tank, the spiders were not equipped with lasers or shields as their larger cousins were. Instead, they were equipped with mechanical tentacles that were used for hacking apart or tossing about soldiers or anyone unlucky enough to be sighted by these monstrosities, making them only capable of close quarters combat. They were essentially the attack dogs to the much larger herons, which would send them forward in raids. More perplexing to people back then was that the spiders were not directly controlled by Martian pilots, but rather by computers slaved directly to a heron, which meant that if the master heron was knocked out, the spiders that were enslaved by it would surrender to the enemy and become compliant. This technology was rather baffling to humanity at the time, but nowadays with computers being near ubiquitous, it doesn't seem like much, with even many teenagers of the day being able to conclude that the spiders were AI controlled by a computer within the Heron. But more terrifying for the human soldiers however, would be the lice. The lice were insect-like contraptions that crawled across no man's land in the dead of the night to harvest anything they could find, from dead bodies to munitions and barbed wire, making terrible screeching noises as they did so. By the daytime, the battlefield would be clean, and their choice in targets led to the prominent wartime myth that the Martians were harvesting and eating humans, which became a prominent propaganda image during the wartime. For decades, the most prominent PTSD image of veterans of the Martian war seemed to be the sounds of the lice on patrol. But the humans were not fighting this war idly. Many advancements were made, 
the war would see the first use of gas masks by the soldiers, as the Martian machines released large amounts of poison gas that could be fatal if breathed in. The land suffered greatly from this pollution, and to this day, large sections of France and Central Europe remain simply impossible to farm. Attempts to break the stalemate with the Allies' own chemical weapons had no effect. A unified military command would be established in Paris to lead the human war effort, while the laboratories at Roundway Down in England and the University of Paris in France dedicated countless sleepless hours to studying the new enemies and finding ways to counter them. The first land ships, starting out as little more than a tractor with a machine gun on them, would also be deployed during the war against the Martians. And while the initial deployments would fare poorly, they paved the way for future advancement. Many new weapons were made specifically for countering Martian tech, such as a modified version of the elephant gun, designed to blow apart spiders. In the air, airplanes and zeppelins would be deployed. Despite initial fears, zeppelins actually fared rather well, as the herons were notoriously terrible shots. It is believed the herons were such terrible shots because their shots were simply so powerful they couldn't be properly aimed. Aerial vehicles would provide very useful for the human war effort, as the Martians never deployed any aerial vehicles of their own, making the Martian war effort completely stuck to the ground. Early model warplanes had difficulty with the machine gun and the propeller, causing some pilots to accidentally shoot each other down. But over time, progress were made with the German-designed Fokker and the British Albatross dominating the skies. But for a large chunk of the war, airplanes would mainly be used for scouting purposes. Many famous air aces made a name for themselves, such as Sir Charles Longcroft or Manfred von Richthofen. The recurring trend was that as more advanced weapons were put onto the field, more men were sent out or drafted and larger offensives would be launched against the Martians. While stories of shell shock and trauma would eventually shine through from the battlefields, most newspapers were forbidden from reporting the worst aspects of the war, in an attempt to keep up morale. For most of the war, newspapers encouraged patriotism and were overwhelmingly positive about the war effort. In the east, Russian infantrymen created special improvised firebombs using bottles of gasoline and cloth in an attempt to fight the Martian spiders, nicknamed the Red Roasters. These would sadly prove useless against the Martian machines. Most of the new war machines would be designed and thought up in Britain and to a lesser extent France, but much of the manufacturing would be done in factories across the Atlantic in the United States. While the American industrial capacity was integral to the Allied war effort, many Allied troops, especially outside the Western Front, were forced to use whatever weapons they could find lying around, with scavenging being very common. Every retaliation attack was extremely costly, as despite the advancements being made, human technology paled in comparison to Martian war machines. But Earth did have the home advantage, as well as far superior numbers. The fact that the war was an existential threat for humanity also dissuaded any notion of surrender, and united even the most hated enemies to fight alongside each other. Any attempt at diplomacy by neutrals would always result in death, which was unsurprising, as the Martians went out of their way to kill any humans they saw, and made their first action on Earth the raising of various Central European cities. However, there were persistent theories amongst many, most notably H.G. Wells and Leon Trotsky, that the Martians only acted aggressively because the Germans attacked them first a prominent theory held by many notables even to this day. But the fact that the Martians made no further attempt at communication dissuades this theory amongst most mainstream historians. In Russia, the Tsar attempted to rally the nation around him. And while his St. Petersburg speech is still one of the most recognizable from the war and in the 20th century, most Russians still felt little loyalty to the man they saw as a weak ruler. At sea, the Royal Navy was able to keep the Martians from escaping the continent. Bombarding any herons that came even close to the shoreline, successfully stopping any attempted invasion of the British Isles. Most famously, the Battle of the HMS Thunderchild, where the ship by that name took on three Martian herons attempting to wade across the English Channel on their own, single-handedly stopping the invasion of Britain. The Royal Navy would end up working closely with the surviving High Seas Fleet and the United States Atlantic Fleet, 
along with France and the remnants of the Dutch, Danish and Belgian fleets. However, among the heroics, many mutinies occurred, with several sailors seizing their ships and taking them out to seas. However, two major events would change the face of the war. The first was the Star Storm of 1914. While initially believed to have been more falling stars, the Star Storm actually originated from the Martian original landing site in Central Europe. Many soldiers wrote about seeing the stars flying overhead on the Christmas Eve of 1914. One of their targets was the Atlantic Ocean. Upon impact, tidal fluctuations would occur and flooding would hit several coastal regions. Not long afterwards, Martian sea machines, soon to be known as Krakens, would begin appearing. Now suddenly, the Martians posed a threat to Allied shipping, as they attacked merchant ships and pulled them underwater, as well as attacking the Royal Navy. Thanks to their long range, some of these machines even made it to the Far East and threatened Japan initially. This pushed both the US and Japan into further increasing their support for Europeans, seeing that the Martians were now proving to be a direct threat to their own nations. In response to this threat, however, Spain would also opt to join the Allies, as would Mexico and Brazil, although the latter two would only provide moral support along with few volunteer squads. The Star Storm would not exclusively target the oceans, however, as several more pods would land in the Middle East, bringing the aging Ottoman Empire into the war. Initially, the Ottomans had remained neutral, believing that attempting to fight the Martians would lead to their troops being slaughtered. But they did continue to supply the Allies with oil and they made efforts to fortify their borders. But unfortunately for the Turks, the Star Storm would see a landing in Persia, which split into two assaults between British India and Turkey, as well as a landing in Egypt. Upon landing, the Martians of the Persian landing began specifically targeting what little existing oil infrastructure there was in the region, lending credence to the idea that the Martians were interrogating humans they have captured behind their lines, and that they were now attempting to deny the Allies fuel. The Ottoman military fared little better than its European counterparts, being completely overwhelmed by the Martian machines, and early attempts at Grand Offensive by Enver Pasha led to failure. But their assistance in the defense of the Suez Canal during the attempted Martian attack was considered one of the aging empire's proudest moments, as well as a high point in Anglo-Turkish relations. Notably, Istanbul was largely ignored by the Martians, strangely resulting in the city being largely preserved by the war. Initially, the Martians moved quickly and easily across the desert landscape of Egypt, but they would ultimately falter at the Suez Canal itself. Ultimately, the Ottomans' predetermined defensive lines, combined with British assistance, would allow them to hold on the Martian onslaught from the east, along with quick shipments of the Allies' new weaponry. The assault on the other end into British India would be largely bogged down by terrain, as the Martian machines seemed to struggle to maneuver across mountains. Helping was the locals' determination in fighting against the Martians, seeing the life under the British as preferable to Martian extermination. Unlike the Western Front, there would be no extensive trench networks dug in Afghanistan or India, with General Charles Alexander Anderson focusing on raids or simply fighting off the Martians with counterattacks. One notable fighter in the Indian front was a charismatic young lawyer from South Africa by the name of Mohandas Gandhi, who went to his homeland of India to encourage Indians to join the British army eventually signing up himself to keep India free. Gandhi would later go on to use his war hero status to become one of India's first representatives onto the League of Nations after Indian independence had been achieved. Surprisingly, the Martians would withdraw back into Persia to focus on Turkey, where yet another stalemate would ensue as the Martians halted their advance once more, baffling the Allied high commands and leaving another Martian zone between British Afghanistan and Kurdistan. The jungles of Africa would also see some fighting as a result of the Star Storm, but despite initial fears, the terrain proved difficult for both sides as the Martians once again seemed unfamiliar with how to fight in this new environment. The German government had set up a government in exile in Germany's African colonies, as had Belgium in the Congo, where they believed they would not be under threat from the Martians only to be proven wrong by this new landing. The German forces under Leto Vorbeck, collaborating with the French under Marshal Pétain, 
would work closely with the governments of Abyssinia on this front. And the Martian forces in Africa received no new reinforcements after meeting their fate in the Congo. Notably, a large number of Martian soldiers would die during this African campaign from non-combat causes compared to the other fronts, with many soldiers theorizing that the Martians were just as vulnerable to African diseases as they themselves were. Another short front would be opened when Irish radicals revolted against the British. While the British initially asked for Allied support in putting the revolt down, the United States in particular would pressure them to grant Ireland independence, so that troops would not have to be diverted from the front, which London would begrudgingly accept. Various attempts at turning the tide were made. The most notable attempts would be Operation Dandelion, the capture of a Martian. The operation would hope for the capture of a Martian Heron to obtain its pilot, with some hoping that he could be held hostage in exchange for the withdrawal of its brethren from Earth. But it was eventually decided that this would not work, and the plan was changed to simply learning all they could from capturing a live Martian. The plan worked as an Heron was blown up from beneath its feet and dragged back to human lines by surrendering spiders. It would be from their analysis that the second major event of the war would come about, a horrifying discovery that changed the face of the war. The Martians were not trying to win, but they were perpetuating the conflict intentionally. It had been noted that the Martians had not done much expansion beyond Central Europe, aside from opening up a few other fronts briefly but these fronts would never receive as much focus as the European one. While the few big victories against the Martians would be celebrated, these were typically undone by the next day. But no attempts at advancing further into France or Russia were ever made, even though the Martians, by all accounts, easily could have. For the most part, victories against the Martians would be done through hit and run attacks or through the Martians retreating from their own gains for seemingly no reason. But then it was discovered that they were not here to conquer and colonize the earth as it was seemingly first thought. Airplanes that were able to fly over Germany returned to tell the tale that many structures that once stood proudly had now disappeared. And it has also been noted from the few captured Martian machines that many of the machines they were fighting had been built right here on earth with the same metals used in artillery shells. And it was here that the realization was made. Every victory was a farce by the Martians to encourage the humans to launch larger and larger attacks. And every bomb dropped. Every dead soldier provided more and more metal from them to harvest and create more machines. They had been using the Allied strategy against them from the very beginning. And the other fronts opened up at little strategic gain beyond prolonging the war for them. And the lack of support on those fronts was most definitely due to the Martians not harvesting as many bodies from them. In Central and Eastern Europe, a different form of horror materialized. As the Martians grinded Western Europe into the ground, the Martians decided to make their holdings more hospitable for the long term. Structures completely alien to humans of the time, strange and ominous, were erected. Most notably, the Martian Forge. The vast amount of toxins giving off by the Martian machines made the region almost unbearable for humans, to the point that this arrow forming was initially believed to be a Martian attempt at killing humans in their territory. But this did not stop guerrilla fighters from staying behind the lines and attempting to sabotage Martian machines in any way they could from behind the lines. In response, the Martians began destroying any human settlements they came across. Some made uncomfortable comparisons between the invaders and the colonizing tactics used by the European powers in that era, with H.G. Wells famously comparing the Martian invasion to the British genocide against the native Tasmanians. In the Middle East, the Martians began digging up and drilling for oil indiscriminately, using strange drilling contraptions that caused heavy damage to the air in the region. To this day, it is still unknown what the Martians actually did with the oil they harvested only that it was not able to be recovered and the operation is believed to have been a large diversion to prolong the war. The fear of fuel shortages meant that large amounts of fuel were now diverted to the war effort at the cost of the civilian front. While the Afghan front was short and the Martian force was small, environmental damage still occurred, albeit on a smaller scale compared to the other fronts. Things would become even more shocking in late 1919 
when suddenly an Allied air squadron was shot out of the sky. Not from the surface, but from the first Martian aircraft. Suddenly, the Allies had lost air superiority. While lacking the shields of their Heron brethren, the Martian flying machines, codenamed by the Allies as Hornets, made up for their defensive shortfall by being faster than their opposition, almost immediately outclassing everything the Allies had and swatting airplanes right out of the sky. The fact that they were unmanned, much like the Spiders, which wouldn't be discovered until after the war, allowed them to get away with maneuvers that could kill the pilots if they had them. Flak weaponry was researched, and missions are made against the Martian airfields. Attempts were made to capture a Martian Hornet, but the only nation to successfully capture one intact was Russia. Other flying machines would also appear, codenamed Condors. These large, slow-moving machines acted as the aerial equivalent to the Herons, containing Martian controllers and acting similarly to the Allied Zeppelins, being used in bombing rage and were far larger and more heavily armed than their Hornet counterparts. While the Allies maintained the numbers advantage, even in the air, the Allied strategy at this point was truly broken, as any ground assault would be forced back when the Hornets appeared, and the defensive lines suddenly became merely theoretical by the near air presence alongside the constant bombing raids by the Condors. To make the matters worse, the aerial observations that were able to return safely began to notice that the Martians were gearing up for a massive offensive, bigger than ever seen before. High Command received word and came to the conclusion that, with the sudden achievement of air superiority by the Martians, combined with their attacks on the Allied fleet at sea, the Martians were now aiming to expand their lines. Soon, France would fall, Russia would see a massive push, and Britain could be next. However, it would also be around this time that the final key to defeating the Martians would be discovered. The first living Martian to be captured would die in captivity. Not from wounds, but from Earth-born diseases, specifically influenza. The discovery of the weak Martian immune system would give humanity the clue it needed to bring victory. A weaponized flu. In 1920, this new disease would be unleashed onto the front, wiping out the majority of the Martians. However, the original plan of releasing the disease via airplane over Martian territory was thrown out of the window when the Martians began their assault ahead of time with the Martian assault on France. Allied artillery defenses were sliced apart, and the air raid on Paris decimated the city before the invaders ever arrived. And with the Martians no longer playing around, the Allies were forced to fall back, with Martian ground forces reaching the city in less than two weeks after their offensive started. One of the most famous images of the war was the burning of Paris, with condors flying overhead and Martian ground forces marching through the city. Some French government officials managed to escape to Britain, but the attack was still devastating for the Allied morale. Moreover, this assault meant that the disease would have to be released in a civilian area. The battle was terrible, but as it went on, the Martians began to grow sick and die, and eventually they fell back. Unfortunately, the disease mutated and began to spread through Paris out of control, eventually infecting most of the human world in a pandemic. Some theorized that the flu mutated the way it did because of the contact with the Martian biology, causing some to nickname it the Martian flu. However, the vast majority of the invading force would be wiped out by returning Martian forces carrying the disease. And an allied counterattack was able to be made to wipe out the remaining stragglers of the invasion force, with many of the lost Martian machines having been found self-destructed in their camps indicating that the Martians may have chosen suicide over capture, or possibly that they were ordered to destroy their technology so that humanity couldn't possibly get their hands on it. Not even the new aircraft could save the Martians. And after what would be commonly known as bloody 1920, the war was finally over. And right on time as well, as observations indicate that right after the fall of Paris, the Martians were mobilizing their forces to make a final push against Russia as well. While the war has been won, many cynics said that it was not victory so much as survival. Europe had been devastated, 20 million people had died in the war, and two great powers had been completely wiped off the face of the earth. With Germany's industry having taken a significant blow from the Martians melting down or grinding up anything of metal they could find, 
not to mention the environmental impact of Martian pollution. An entire generation of young men would be scarred, and Europe's population would take a generation to rebuild. With the end of the war, Europe was to be reorganized. American President Woodrow Wilson in particular thought that this was the best opportunity to preach his ideals, but in the end he would have little say over the rearrangement of Central Europe. The region to this day, combined with the massive post-war brain drain of prominent figures like Albert Einstein, remains far poorer than even Eastern Europe. Central Europe, for a long time, remained under the provisional authority of the League of Nations, an organization designed to prevent conflicts between human nations as well as unify mankind against future alien threats. The League delegates most of its power to the Big Five Council, consisting of the United States, Britain, France, Russia and Japan, with the latter two not joining the Big Council until the latter half of the 20th century. The League's secondary purpose was to prepare for a potential second Martian invasion, and while attempts at a global unified military structure have been attempted, conflict between nations still makes this difficult, with countries often calling international troops to serve in their own armies. And League bases across the world are often forced to put up with calls for nationalization. Of course, the League is far from perfect with his main duties being helping the rebuilding efforts after the war and managing the non-Western world. Many in Africa would come to view the League of Nations as a replacement for the European empires of old, which was fair, considering that some European empires took precedence in mandating. But as of today, things are looking stable in the region. While nowadays an optimistic image is painted of the reconstruction, in truth, many unfortunate events occurred during the rebuilding years that were simply not massively reported upon, often due to set reporting being discouraged by the League of Nations. A notable example being the actions of radical zealots in hunting down supposed communists, whom they believed would take this moment of human weakness to strike and destroy everything, and sometimes even disguised Martians. Germany in particular rapidly went from initial human solidarity to lifeboat rules. The United States would also see a red summer with some overzealous types even attempting to claim that blacks were Martian human hybrids, a fact that obviously has no basis in reality, with riots across the country being put down by the returning expeditionary forces from Europe. The former German Empire remains divided between Prussia in the north and Bavaria in the south, a division supported back then by the British Empire, who saw a divided Germany as more beneficial to their empire in the long run, as well as France, who desired a restoration of the pre-1870 European order. Initially, the plan would see Germany divided into multiple states akin to pre-unification Germany. But this move proved highly unpopular within Germany itself, with many Germans, including many war veterans, protesting the decision. After the grisly affair of the Rhine Rebellion, which nearly saw fellow war veterans of the Allied power turning against each other, it would be decided that the Germans would have more of a say in drawing up their own new states, resulting in the present-day north-south split. The former states of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire would go off on their own, but Austria itself would be incorporated into South Germany, with Hungary being propped up by the League of Nations to keep out any anarchist rebel. Initially, North Germany, under its first chancellor Erich Ludendorff, would align with Russia before finally reconciling with the West in the 1940s. Russia itself would survive the war, but the Tsar's popularity did not. Much of Russia's industrial centers in the West were devastated, and he didn't help with his connection to the mad monk Rasputin, who many in Russia had suddenly concluded was a Martian plant, resulting in his assassination. These failures, combined with previous screw-ups throughout his reign and his predecessors, forced him to abdicate. The newly formed republic did not last long, however, due to competing influences from radicals, culminating in an authoritarian state dominated by the military under General Lover Kornilov that seized much of Eastern Europe into an alliance in the 30s, while also attempting to build Russian industry up as fast as possible. The end of the war would also see the independence of Poland. While the Poles had fought heroically, there wouldn't be very many left after the war, so a smaller Poland would end up being carved out. And initially, Poland would only receive lands that were extremely devastated by the Martians. And much like their neighbors, extensive rationing would be put into place 
due to the extreme damage to the landscape caused by the Martians. However, despite the rocky start, Poland by now has managed to become a flourishing democracy after years of dictatorship, although conscription is still law, mainly due to the fear of Russia. To the south, Italy had relatively little rebuilding to do after the war compared to its northern neighbors, with only its far northern regions having been hit, and most of the focus was put on rebuilding Venice. There was a brief fear that Marshal Luigi Cadorna, the main Italian military leader during the Martian War, would lead the government into asserting itself violently in the years after the war, notably putting down a nationalist march on Rome in 1922. Italy would sign an agreement with Spain to form the Latin Axis, supposedly to protect themselves from northern encroachment. Many feared that this Axis might have become a rival to the League and foster human division, but ultimately the Italian military cabinet would not survive to see the 30s and Spain would choose to leave the new Axis, not seeing any real chance at getting anything out of it once the new leaders came to power in Italy, and the government remains brittle to this day. To the north, France would see several crackdowns against communist uprisings over wartime authoritarianism persisting post-war. A wannabe Napoleon figure attempted to seize power once more with the backing of the military, but unlike the Napoleons, the people would not back this new regime and the coup would ultimately be stopped by mass workers' protests, resulting in a significant decline in power of the French military, not helped by the French military's withdrawal from Algeria after failing to win against insurgents in 1924. In the direct aftermath of the war, Italy would gain more territory in Northern Africa from the war-weary allies, albeit reluctantly, and the less we say about Italy's authoritarian practices in Libya, the better. With Belgium having been completely eradicated as a result of the war, the Congo would be transferred to the authority of the Rump Kaiserreich in Africa until the Kaiser finally agreed to abdicate and recognize the two new German governments, putting the former German colonies under the control of North Germany until decolonization occurred in the 70s. In the East, Japan managed to get its hand on most of the European possessions in China during the war. Britain would renew its alliance with Japan in an effort to contain an expanding Russia, which included allowing Japanese influence to increase over China, seeing it as preferable to Russian expansion. The Japanese still desired resources, and so they built up their army massively, ostensibly to prepare for a potential second invasion from Mars, but in practice these men would be used to fight in China. The resulting war between Japan and China would begin with attempts to negotiate China into becoming a Japanese puppet, but would gradually evolve into a long and bloody occupation, lasting from the 1930s to the 1960s, ultimately seeing much of China under Japanese occupation for 20 years afterward, with an independent Manchuria and several Japanese-backed controlled cities on the coast being the legacy today. The League of Nations would back this endeavor, seeing Japan as more capable of protecting the region than anyone else there. It was because of this injustice that to this day the Republic of China refuses to join the League of Nations. As other European powers decolonized, these former colonies would fall to Japanese influence, with Vietnam and Mongolia remaining under Japanese influence even today. The old Ottoman Empire survived the war and was propped up by Britain as a containment measure against potential Russian expansion into the Middle East. While initially struggling to remain intact, as Turkish nationalists launched an attempted revolt after the war, the Ottomans would eventually find great wealth in Arabian oil fields. In the end, it was the rising empires of the United States and Japan that won the most out of the war, with the two not having to worry about rebuilding and both striking it rich in some way or another. The various other ethnic groups under Ottoman rule aren't really that much caring for their Turkish rulers, and it's hard to see how much longer the British will tolerate their ethnic policies on the Arabian Peninsula. To the east, Iran is under an autocratic British-backed Shah who, for a long time, has relied on the League, and specifically Britain, to remain in power. For a long time, the areas outside of Tehran and the other major cities were borderline anarchic after the Martian War. Nowadays, there are worries that Russian-backed revolutionaries may become popular enough to overthrow the Thaw of Persia. Racial progress was also made as a result of the invasion, with segregation ending in 1929, and pan-humanism being at its most powerful in the United States, even in spite of the initial Red Summer 
and President Wilson's regressive policies during the course of the Martian War. Many in the European colonies would also bring back progressive ideals with them, as thousands of natives had been conscripted to fight and die alongside white men, who proved just as vulnerable and inferior in the face of the Martian might, killing the myth of inherent European superiority. Not long after the war, nationalist movements rose up in colonies around the world, and while initially the League of Nations attempted to enforce European superiority for the safety of mankind, they would eventually be forced to accept decolonization. Some parts of Africa would become British dominions, maintaining close ties with Britain while remaining theoretically independent. The Portuguese would keep their colonial system, but allow for more local autonomy to make up for it. However, German Africa would be messy, as many of the settlers from Germany weren't too fond of returning to their destitute homeland, leading to the bloody Middle Africa War from 1964 to 1979, which saw the League of Nations intervene and would leave Middle Africa as a poor nation to this very day. Mistrust for Asians would remain for a longer amount of time, due to tensions with Japan and the United States in particular, and China's staunch refusal to help in the human war effort in general. On the other hand, respect for the Middle Eastern peoples grew as a result of their actions in the war, alongside their African counterparts. Traditional sexism was also common in areas heavily devastated by the Martian invasion, with places such as Russia, Hungary and Poland encouraging having as many children born as possible, with some regions even encouraging polygamy, leading to a baby boom taking place in Eastern Europe, unlike Central Europe. Religion has had to adapt to the existence of the Martians. Some churches decreed that Martians, not being present in the Bible account of creation, had no souls or were the minions of hell with some religious groups during the war believing that the invasion was an apocalypse. The Russian Orthodox Church outright states that the Martians were demons, a statement backed by the Russian government. And as a result, the Russian government almost always refers to them as such, as do the Ottomans. The nations of East Asia have adapted better to this, and most secular nations generally go along with scientific explanations, although the word evil is thrown around a lot. Some environmentalists have made comparisons to the technological Martians and the rapid industrialization of Earth in the lead up to their invasion, pointing out that if humanity kept going on their current trajectory, they would end up exactly like the Martians. Some cults during and after the war even took to worshipping the Martians as angels of some sort, with some accusing these looms of being Martians in disguise. Communism is less popular than in our own timeline and doesn't actually get put into practice by any major nation, instead remaining in the realm of utopian ideologies. While underground movements exist in Russia, communism remains more active in the West. Many have tried to claim communism is inhuman due to the Martians supposedly collectivizing all the resources they collected. Some communists have pulled the reverse card by saying that the technological advancements of the Martians would therefore prove that communism is the future of humanity if technological progress continues as it has. By present day, both Germanys have recovered, and while almost 90% of its pre-war population was wiped out during the war, not helped by the massive exodus during and after the war, numbers have now become stable again, even after the Prussian government enacted its one-child policy, stating that any married couple must produce at least one child as well as making a lot of arranged marriages and practically handing out rations and privileges to women who bear children to ensure an increased birth rate. The government, while no longer under military rule, remains paternalistic and nationalistic, with society remaining highly regimented to ensure that order is maintained. The five-year plans by Ludendorff to ensure that North Germany's ruined infrastructure would be rebuilt and agricultural rationing in the early years have largely succeeded, but the whole country has a strong, glooming atmosphere. Southern Germany would become a proper republic after the war, with the Habsburgs continuing to live on in the private sector. Initially, the government was just as brittle as its northern counterpart, with assassinations being dangerously common, and extremists being dangerously popular, and it would take various state-backed militias to truly tame the chaos of the first year. Vienna would be rebuilt from the ground up after the war, and become a very lively city, the largest in Central Europe, managing to regain its old status as a hub of culture, albeit more focused on the future than the past. The country as a whole tends to be quite big on Catholic pride as well, 
The South is also nationalistic and maintains a heavily armed police force to hold down any extremist that may attempt to take power, a move that the League is starting to grow weary of supporting. A large German minority also exists in Britain, Canada and the United States, having been displaced by the invasion, and largely consisting of those who disagreed with the old imperial regime, making up a significant voting bloc in the latter, and the former African colonies of Germany still have German as a major second language. The two big Western European nations of Britain and France remain quite conservative, although Britain's federation plans have been a great success. On the French side, Mars has essentially become a part of the French national identity, replacing the British and the Germans as their greatest historical enemy. They remain the most eager to slaughter Martians, and it's a trope that French delegates at the League of Nations meetings in Geneva will almost make a scene to ensure that the whole world is reminded of the time that the Martians blitzed Paris. In spite of this patriotism, by the modern day, most French Gen Zers think that the old timers need to get over themselves, while sad old timers complain about how these youngsters never went through the same shit that they did. Unlike Britain, the French weren't so successful at keeping their former colonies on their side. In many ways, Europe is very much a mix of Edwardian era Europe in terms of nationalism and military buildup, with a very cynical outlook and increased reliance on the US. The United States also retains a lot of Gilded Age elements to it. No 60s counterculture and no red scares means that there is less radicalism in American politics on either side, with the main counterculture being 20th century style socialism. Religion still remains strongly influential on both sides, having seen a major upsurge in the aftermath of the invasion in the United States in particular with atheism remaining suspect in many communities. Interventions in South America started to become unpopular with the production of the television set and 24-hour news cycles, showing them the grisly side of war in the Mexican intervention. No party switch basically means that the Democrats are still the party of the right and the Republicans are the progressive party. The South was slow to pick up on many reforms, and they somehow managed to hijack the anti-Martian hysteria to try and dethrone some political opponents, such as preachers claiming that blacks were the way they were due to Martian ancestry, or that communists were inhumane due to their collectivist nature of the Martians, and remain backwards to this day. There is a lot of tension on the Mexican-American border, as yet another Mexican government has collapsed, and American mobilization in the southwest states has led to potential for yet another expedition into the northern Mexican states. Tensions with Russia have yet to subside, with many in the country believing that the Western powers abandoned Russia to fend for itself during the Martian War, with many pointing out how the Western powers fought them in the Crimean War. To this day, Russia remains a secretive country for its size, although ever since the 1960s, liberalization has occurred as the military government lost power in the 1969 coup. Today, some within the Duma are calling for glasnost with the West. In the Balkans, Yugoslavia remains allied with the Russians, but is growing unstable, with the Christians and Muslims particularly hating each other. Not helping is the Russians attempting to expand their influence over the Yugoslav government. Yugoslavia's monarchy is seen as increasingly weak and had to contend with Hungary and Romania to the north, although the two of them seem more focused on each other than Yugoslavia, with a brief war between the two breaking out in the late 20s. It is believed that Yugoslavia's potential collapse may lead to the next league action. Most of Russia's sphere remains with Russia due to the Russian promise of defense against the Martians if they ever return. To the south of Russia, the Republic of China is considered worrisome, having seen Japanese withdrawal from their territory. For much of the 20th century, China were a political wildcard with messy politics and a massive population, with China very often being led by gruesome leaders justifying all their actions in the name of one day expelling Japan from East Asia and reclaiming all Chinese stolen territories. As of now, the Chinese dictatorship seems to be no more, and a rather nationalistic and corrupt democracy is now in place, with Japan still being enemy number one in China. Martian technology would be the biggest focus of the next decade, with each of the major allied powers having laboratories dedicated to the invaders. South Germany would initially try to make money by charging high rates for scientists to enter their lands to see the forge, home to the largest Martian camp during the war. Despite initial hopes, however, mankind 
would not be able to reverse engineer the vast majority of Martian technology for decades. With the infamous lasers only being reverse engineered recently, and even then on a much smaller scale than anything seen during the war. The Heron's antimatter shield has also only been figured out recently, and even then, it requires a building full of equipment just to use it. And the dark matter drives that the Martians use to power their machines still remain a mystery to this very day. Most wartime reverse engineering was unsuccessful, as wartime scientists couldn't figure out what powered the Martian war machines. And the heavily damaged state of most remaining Martian machines doesn't help. Even today, piloting the Martian Herons remains too dangerous for humans, as the machines require the pilot to essentially have their nervous system wired directly into the machines. The few attempts to start a machine with a human pilot resulted in total brain death each time, and other attempts at workarounds resulted in the machines, of which there was a limited amount, being heavily damaged, with repair being close to impossible due to the materials needed still being unavailable or unreplicatable on the Earth. To this day, it's still a mystery of how the Martians were able to build these machines with only Earth minerals. In a similar fashion, to this very day, scientists have no idea how the spider's AI actually works, as all attempts at replicating it has led to inferior products not nearly as smart as the spiders themselves. To this day, the only surviving specimens vigilantly patrol outside the Martian War Museum in Bristol, protecting their former masters, currently the crown jewel of the museum, while also being an effective deterrent for any intruders. Most AI today is used in drones or industrial centers. The only exceptions were the lice, who continued to patrol Europe for any shred of metal they could find until 1923, often doing an effective job of cleaning up the former battlefields. The Krakens at sea would also continue to operate, attacking human ships throughout the early 20th century, until the loss was sighted in 1957. Later investigations discovered that all the lice traveled back to the original landing point in Bohemia, where they deposited their findings into a giant forge. This forge, known only as the Martian Forge, was believed to be part factory, part cannon, as many believed that the Star Storm of 1914 originated from this forge. While before the discoveries it was believed that these were Martian reinforcements, contemporary evidence indicates that this was actually the Martians sending a large portion of their bounty back to their homeworld. Aside from this forge, there seemed to be no other Martian structures built on Earth beyond unusual power plants for their machines and smaller versions of the forge in former cities such as Vienna. Despite space travel being massively popularized thanks to the Martian invasion, these dreams wouldn't actually be accomplished until the 1950s, as the spaceships the Martians used only seemed to be able to go one way, with the intent being that they would be melted down to make more war machines after they landed. The Martian forge was believed to have been capable of launching the Martians back home but it remains dormant and inactive to this very day. The Martian Hornets came too late into the conflict, meaning that there were very few of them in existence. And to this day, no one knows how their anti-gravity systems work. The one fully preserved specimen is in St. Petersburg, and Russia still refuses to allow the League to get a good look at it. But like the Herons, piloting the Hornets seems to be impossible for humans. Fear of eventual Martian returns, drove space exploration and the scramble for the moon. The Earth's orbit is now filled with space stations, and each of the Big Five has at least one base on the moon. But one particular development that was massively sped up by the Martian War was the unlocking of atomic power. While the shields and the lasers of the Herons were powered by dark matter drives, the machines themselves were powered by small fusion reactors. It is believed that the Martians were either less affected by radiation, weren't affected by it at all, or were just callous with their troops. As it is now known with modern science that these reactors the Martians used on their machines were notoriously dirty, contributing to the destruction of the landscape they trod upon. Many of the first peoples to enter the Herons would be unintentionally exposed and end up dying painfully later in their lives as a result of radiation poisoning. But through this discovery, and with the help of brilliant minds such as Albert Einstein, humanity would manage to master atomic power, with new bomber forces being put in place amongst the big five of the League of Nations, seeing the atomic bombs as the ultimate Martian killers. Of course, this has led to worry of the Martians having developed their own equivalent that dwarfs mankind's achievements. More worrying is the threat of human nations using atomic bombs against each other 
as the threat of a new Martian invasion seems to decrease over time. Then of course we have the Martians themselves. The majority of Martians in the invasion were killed by the pandemic and a few survivors were kept as prisoners, many being former pilots of the Hornets. Many were intentionally mistreated by their captors, with Russia famously dissecting them while they were still alive just to learn how they functioned. Those under League of Nations purview were kept alive for as long as possible for study and potential communication, with the last Martian prisoner dying in 1956, the same year the last Kraken was sighted. Feeding the Martians was difficult as they couldn't digest earth materials, forcing the League to use existing rations from the war and communication was even worse as the Martians couldn't speak or even use sign language due to lacking hands or even a human shape. Not helping was that none of the Martians were actually interested in cooperating with their captors. The best humanity has in terms of finding out the motivations of the Martians were translated text, cracked by linguists decades later. And even they don't say much, mostly being nothing more than personal journey entries and notes, many of which outright admit that the Martian soldiers had no idea what Homeworld Command was up to and that they're just following orders. The most they could get from these texts were allusions to a crisis on the Homeworld that required harvesting from another world to survive, with the mention of military forces being rapidly sent to any planet that they could reach. But strangely, these journals don't seem to describe a planet similar to Mars, instead implying an oceanic environment, nothing like Earth's outer neighbor. The general consensus during the war was that these Martians were aiming to colonize Earth and steal its resources, or even claim Earth as their new homeworld. But new discoveries indicate that their objective was simply to acquire any resources at any cost, with no long-term goals for holding on to Earth. Mankind was simply expandable for the Martians. Analysts were also able to discern a strange religion that the Martians seemed to adhere to. Speaking of, he who sleeps and what experts believe to be official documents between Martian officers indicating some sort of revered autocrat back home, which many speculate to be a monarch. Of course, with all the advancement humanity has made, even the Martians' tech tactics during the war now seem backwards by comparison. If not for their shields, the Herons would be ripped apart by modern, quicker human weaponry, and the spiders would be easily destroyed with what mankind has available now. The Martian Hornets are believed to have been on par with early jet aircraft as best, so it is likely that modern aircraft could potentially take them out without even seeing them in combat. Of course, with that in mind, some pessimistic types pointed out that the likelihood is that the Martians have advanced their own technology in the century after the war as well, and that we've only seen their equivalent to machine guns and artillery, and for all we know, they may have made their own advancements that make their tech from the Great Martian War look just as primitive as a Maxim does today. Not helping the invaders case is the amount of contingencies now in place, with underground bunkers having been constructed to safeguard civilians in case of a second evasion. What was terrifying to people back then, however, has now increasingly become mundane as the people of the day have adapted to how fast technology has become. The decades of the 2010s would be home to a series of discoveries. The first manned missions to Mars would be commenced during these years. These missions only confirmed what the probes had verified earlier, that the red planet was a dead world, but moreover, that there was no evidence of the planet ever being inhabited. This had led to a resurgence in theories that the Martians were not actually from Mars, or that the planet was merely a forward operating base of sorts. This has caused many to rename the Martians to simply Invader or Wendigos, while others are still insisting that the Martians did indeed come from Mars, but they are simply hiding under the ground. By now, many people are becoming worried, as with the distance in time since the last Martian invasion has resulted in many people in the League becoming lax towards the idea of another invasion. And many nations are starting to think about cutting their funds to the League to fund their own projects. Not helping is that the new generations are more distant than ever, with many coming to see the Martians as nothing more of monsters of myth that their grandparents used to scare them with, and increasingly questioning the need for any preparation, especially after the verification that Mars is seemingly dead. The old militarized atmosphere from before the Martian invasion has not truly died. Conscription remains in effect for most nations on Earth, although the attitudes has changed from preparations to fight other humans to preparations to fight the Martians.
But as stated before, these measures are being called into question, and many nations are considering doing away with the draft, mostly nations untouched by the war. And now, as tensions are increasing in Eastern Europe, reports indicate that a meteor has impacted the southern Ural region. Existing tensions prevent a proper investigation that the League of Nations is demanding, as the Russian government refuses any foreign investigators from entering. Several foreign nationals have been arrested for causing a panic in Russia, leading to the Russian representative at the League of Nations officially stating that Russia would not need any outside help, leading some to compare the situation to Germany in the 1910s. Even more so, as satellites indicate that the Russian army has been deployed to the region. Only time will tell what the second meteor has in store. And that's it. That's Markland's scenario. It ran over one hour, which officially makes it the longest scenario ever covered on this channel, but it was absolutely amazing. But that's it for this scenario. Let me know in the comments how you think the scenario develops from here. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing for at least one more alternate history video every week. To help the video grow, consider leaving a like and a comment. It really helps out against the algorithm. Even just commenting something simple like hi helps the video out massively. Again, thank you all for watching, and a special thanks to these patrons who help me dedicate more time and effort to the channel by supporting me monetarily. To help the channel and get early access to videos whenever I complete them myself, consider supporting me there. I try to be two weeks ahead of my recording schedule, so if all is well, you should always have two more possible history videos to watch ahead. Again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.